Let me on behalf of Martin's family extend a warm welcome to all of you who are here with us in the chapel and with us virtually as well. Thank you very much for taking time out of your schedule to be with us with the family as we celebrate his life and his legacy. Our opening hymn is Amazing Grace, Shall We Stand? Andrew Bourne and Gail Veith to offer the tributes. Thank you, Reverend Merle. Um, good evening, everybody. We hope you are in fine spirits and God is with you and always be with you. So, just a few people they want to thank that couldn't make it to the funeral. Too many, too many to mention, and there's only two people, right? Hello, Olga. We wish you could be here, but you are in our hearts, and we will never forget you. 
And thank you, Donna Burroughs of 58 Tartola, Rotong Tartola, for sending the pigeons. Four pigeons. One for the Father, one for the Son, and one for the Holy Ghost, and one for Martin. Because Martin always used to like to fly away. Thank you. I don't see the pigeons yet, though. They're homers, anyway. You know? So, <clears throat> by chance, right? I came across a verse that hit me pretty in Psalms. King David wrote the Psalms from Israel. All of these Psalms. And the most popular is Psalm 23. Right? That's the only psalm I ever heard about, Psalm 23. And he got about 40 psalms. So, here's Psalm 41. For the choir director of Psalm of David, King David of Israel, who Saul wanted to kill, because he was very jealous of King David. He was anointed by Jesus. And he played harp, anointed by God. Celestial music of these spheres. To calm Saul's heart. Right? But David had a friend named Jonathan, who was Saul's son. And he would always protect David. Oh, Saul is coming, Saul is coming. Hide behind there, hide behind there. So David eventually became king of heaven, of, of, of Israel, right? Because he's the same David that went from the shepherd boy that slew the sheep, the lions that were going to eat the sheep. So he was an expert. <clears throat> Got a purpose. Slingshot, right? So when Goliath came out, little David went up to him. The Philistines, right? They wanted to eat up the Israels. And they can't believe that little David going out there with a piece of rubber band and a piece of rubber leather. So David said, you and I to me, show me the smallest hole you got. Right? So a glass big and strong, seven feet tall. David swings back, he pops and hit him straight and he forward in between the Shatters, and that was the end of him. Right? Anointed by God again. Everybody was scared of Goliath. But a big rock is healed everything. Right? So now, all oh, the joys of those who are kind to the poor. That was me. Right? But I don't get the kindness. I just get the poorness. Right? But the poorness brings the kindness. The Lord persecutes them. The Lord rescues them when they are in trouble. If you are kind to the poor, you will be rescued in time of trouble. And if you remember God, you will be rescued. If you remember him, he'll remember you. The Lord protects them and keeps them alive. He gives them prosperity in the land and rescues them from their enemies. That's why not to have any enemies. Right? The Lord nurses them when they are sick and restores them to health. Because you cannot get better with a mind not completely engulfed in God and peace you will remain sick and restores them to health oh Lord I pray have mercy on me heal me for I have sinned against you my enemies say nothing but evil about me how soon will he die and be forgotten they ask now they're talking about King David and King David talking about his friends. 
I came. Right? But all the while they gather and gossip. And when they leave, they spread it everywhere. And all who hate me whisper about me. Imagine the worst. He has some fatal disease, they say. He will never get out of bed. Even my best friend, the one I trusted completely, the one who shared my food, has turned against me. Talk about ungratefulness. Sharing the king's food and then gossiping about it. Lord, have mercy on me again. He has some fatal disease, they say, and he will never get out of bed. That's what they wish, okay? Even my best friend, the one he trusted completely, the one who shared my food and has turned against me. Lord, have mercy on me. Make me well again so I can pay them back. I know you are pleased with me. For you have not let my enemies triumph over me. And then was a lot of enemies. And a lot of gossipers. Right? They have not triumphed. Because God kept them away. Evil don't triumph over good. Right? Good always wins. You have preserved my life because I am innocent. You have brought me into your presence forever. Praise the Lord, the God of Israel, who lives in everlasting to everlasting, everlasting to everlasting, and everlasting. Amen. Amen. Right? Read it again. Huh? Y'all got all of that? Huh? I could read it again, you know. Now we're going on tomorrow, hey, hey, a little bit. All right, I got to sit down. You're doing good. Right? This is yours. That might be it. Wait. Don't go too far. <laughs> this is your speech. That's my, no, that, that's Andrew's speech. No, you said, might. greetings, ladies and gentlemen, musicians and rock stars. Right, that's me. Today we are gathered to wish, I, I can start, I don't know if what will happen. Greetings ladies and gentlemen, musicians, rock stars, want to be rock stars, I want to be musicians. We all have a goal, right? Today we are gathered here to wish the best for Martin in his new life. We hope that he will find what he is seeking. In his, in his new body, he is now free from all his discomforts and problems. I would imagine that this is a wonderful feeling as he truly deserves to feel that way. Before Martin and I were born, we heard something happening outside our mother's stomach. Not something, but many things. For nine months, it was, uh, Martin and I were born 12 months apart. We could always be twins. But we looked like we came from different parents. He, he came from El Salvador and he came from St. John. Right? So no, opposites attract. In this case, it didn't work. Because he was always flying away. Looking and scratching and digging and picking for anything new, 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 new woman, new job, new work, new work, new work, new guitar, you know, Martin. We did not have a clue as to what it was since we were just developing embryos at the time. However, little did we know what was happening was being infused into our ears and into our brains and into our psyche and into our DNA. It was our father's piano playing every day and every evening. My father's piano was playing, 
playing with aggressive and attacking style. So it wasn't like Mary had a little lamb and this, let Martin go to sleep. You know? Hey, Martin, you can't sleep now. I recorded myself and I listened to it myself back. So he never chose to just play, he would record it. Right? So we had to go through nine months of solitary confinement. Right? Never knowing when we would see light that day. But anyway, it was free music lessons, and to get it at that age, you got to be lucky. Right? Because you start with it. From the Big Bang to nine months of. So when we were born, we felt like we were rich in something, but we didn't know what it was. We thought it was rich in fighting, because we used to fight a lot. Right? And he always used to say, boy, better looking at you, you know. I got a mustache. And he got hairs on my chest. And he was better looking at me, a lot better. So Martin and I were getting free music lessons while we were in developing in our mother's belly. Not giving it too much thought after we were born. We did what other kids do, like surfing, which Martin loved to bike riding, bike racing, and cycling other, with other kids who, could also be, who couldn't resist being mischievous as that brought a lot of fun into the arena. As we grew older, say around 11 or 12 years old, we began to feel deeply as we were maturing, and our first hair came out. We say, hey, things happening. We began to feel deeply. We were just a massive urge to acquire our appropriate instruments and get started to play music. As it would happen, we moved so many times in Barbados due to our parents feuding. But we still got in a lot of piano player playing um, after we were born, because they were still together for about four years or so. We managed to move up to um, San Remo, Philip. Because we were renovating and we got a cheap price. If I break fall in the head, that's too bad. Right? Take your chances. So you know, the married boys were rehearsing next door at Philip's house. So you know, mischievous us, me and Martin, we got to suck away everything. So we take a little turn to the right and we see all these equipment in the veranda set up to rehearse. We sing, well, it'll be like we lamp on the right moon. You know? So I remember going up to Jimmy's guitar and touching it for the first time. Wow, this is an electric guitar. This feeling, nothing I ever felt before. You know? And he said, I got to get one of them. And then the other guys came in, started to rehearse. And we were watching. It was good. That time Roger Gibbs was in the band. Right, Jimmy? It was fun. That first rehearsal was fun. As we grew older, say around 11 or 12, we began to feel music deeply. We just had a massive urge to acquire our appropriate instruments and get started. My choice was the lead guitar. Martin, with his small stumpy fingers, that loose to drop all the eggs. Martin, we'll go to the second pen. I come back with four eggs. I said, Daddy, look. Plop. Oh, it's coming eggs again today? Cool. 
He had by the fingers, right? So we put him on the base. Okay? Only had four strings. He said, can't go too wrong with that. Then we left me 36 and you 34. Right? Now don't make no mistakes. Because his fingers weren't that long yet. They were still half long. Right? But they were strong enough to hold that base strings down. Yeah. My choice was the lead guitar, and Martin's choice was the bass. We formed many bands together, and we played birthday parties. At that time, Randy Wilkie was the drummer, adopted from Scotland, so we had a Scottish drummer who had to go home every evening at 3 o'clock for tea. Am I going to keep doing Randall? Tea time. Rehearsal done. Right? So, my choice, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we played at birthday parties. We even played on by Baker, Sandra. I remember up her at the bottom, called right pants I got made, and they were too tight, but I, I, I put on some butter and grease and things, and I, I got it to fit on, you know? You remember that time? We would drive anywhere in the island to play. Bashiba, we played on Bashiba, right? And we had a little bank account, and we would put on our little three fifteen hundred dollars and buy different things that we needed for the band. We had this thing set up, right? When we first saw those guitars, we felt as though we actually found our soulmates. Our first band was called the Mighty Midgets. And soon afterwards, we simply changed the name to the midgets because we weren't not all that mighty, right? We decided to play it safe, right? So music played a major role in our lives up to today because they don't even play. And Martin still played. Martin played. Addie Cliff, and John Chandler, Lancaster House. Just before he died. And he would not stop playing or working. Yes. He especially loved it when he would get compliments from tourists who were also musicians in the audience who would come up to him and when he took a break, a break, and tell him what a great musician and a bass player he was. He made his mark many times over hit his plane and ended up having top musicians in his band. One of them, Victor Linton, from Billy Ocean. Anna Shepard, at one time. And myself, not to be excluded, you know. And Sherman King from Crossfire. Very good man. And I don't see the, the um, saxophonist here. Simon? Maybe he rehearsing. Oh, hey. <laughs> uh, Martin and I became extremely close towards the end of his life. He would always talk about God and heaven, and he became very close to God, be, saying, I'm going to die. And I will spend the rest of my life in heaven, which I wanted to see. So goodbye, Martin, and I hope we will see you again. Thank you for coming to see. 
him of which I know he will appreciate greatly, and God bless each and every one of you. Amen. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Sorry for the half grain. It's by the whole grain. Um, right? At least I can talk. The rest in truth. That will come out later. Um, this is the note that Martin wrote two days before he died. He says, I'm going to heaven and... And he hid it from me. He hid a lot of things from me. I'm going to heaven and what? I will live there forever and ever. And we'll live in heaven for eternity. For eternity. You know the time. You took all the time. You want. Never mind. We're going to give you some extra money. Right? I'm going to go. Okay. I'm going to go fast. Okay. I've known Martin from the time I was 15 years old. I would often hang out in their family home with my sister, Jan. The Bournes lived in a simple and homey house behind the People's Cathedral. Their house was open and airy, and there was absolutely no clutter in it whatsoever. And that is precisely why I found it so charming. I felt so at ease in their home. I loved their mom, Jean. She was the only person at that time who I could chat with about God and the purpose of life. Everyone knows that families have their difficulties as they try to rub off each other's rough edges. The Bournes were no different. At times, there were squabbles. Yet, after my own mom passed away, Jan and I sought refuge in their home as we felt like part of their family. Martin was a supportive brother-in-law to my sister Jan. When I lived in New York, Janny would call me up and say how she had such a nice long talk on the phone with Martin. His humor and kindness would dissolve whatever stress she was dealing with at the time. Martin pushed his nephew, Brandon, onto his very first wave. This began a lifelong obsession with surfing that gave Brandon an outlet to cope with his life as well as the loss of his mom. Martin also became a second father to his niece, Alexa. They would go to the beach, take walks, and chat about life. It's comforting knowing how tender Martin could be whenever he felt he was needed. I live across the cul-de-sac from Jan and Andrew's house. While I'm washing the dishes, I look through my kitchen window onto my beautiful garden and I'm able to see beyond to Andrew's garden as well. It would make me so happy whenever I saw Martin over there spending time with Andrew. I could tell they were becoming close. Martin and Andrew inherited their love for music from their father and their uncle, who played on Broadway, I think. Grandfather's brother. Kim told me that recently Martin was talking a lot to Andrew about music and that Andrew was helping Martin out with whatever his needs were. Through my kitchen window, I could see Kim coming outside with her cappuccino in hand, walking back and forth between Andrew's house and mine, trying desperately to organize her brother's lives. <laughs> After these years, Though they're all grown up to a point, to me, they're still the little born children that I remembered from back then. And now as Martin packs up his experiences and memories, his loves and losses, he will tie a big bow on his time spent on earth. He now pops out onto the third world, the heavenly realm, where we breathe love. It's an even bigger, brighter, and better world from this earthly world. Martin will not be needing a car or a plane or a cell phone, for they will be archaic and unnecessary in this third new dimension. The heavenly realm. Martin will be able to travel just by the thought, just by thought and communicate without words if he wants to. And he will be free from his tired old body. Though we may not be able to see him with our physical eyes, he's with us outside of time and space. 
Did you know we have three lives? Yes, we're all given three lives. Just like Andrew said, we live in our mother's womb in water, then we live on earth breathing air, and then we live in the heavenly realm where we breathe love. Our first life in our mother's womb is safe and protected in the environment of water. After we mature to infancy, it's time to leave that world of water and move to a bigger, brighter, and better world on earth where we breathe air. Though we may be a little afraid to leave that world of water at first, whether we like it or not, there comes a time where we just must leave. Reluctantly, we pop out onto the other side, earth, where we gasp our first breath and find adoring relatives anxiously awaiting our arrival and joy with great expectations. In this second world that we get to grow, we get to grow true love, the kind that grows by living for the sake of others. And that has the capacity to love, like Andrew said, the enemy. We grow our ability to love starting from children's love, then siblings love, then spousal love, and finally, the highest love of all, parental love. As our fruit of love grows, we find it easier to connect and resonate with the heart of God. Why? Because God is also a parent, and God knows only too well the pain of loving children who've lost their way. God is also the encapsulation of those four realms of heart that I mentioned before. And if you weren't paying attention, it was children's love, siblings' love, spousal love, and parental love. And just as at the time of Martin's birth, again, he will be welcomed by anxious relatives in the third world, the heavenly realm, where we breathe love. And I am sure that Granny Orreen will be there. I have such fond memories of hanging out with Martin's Granny Orreen. She would be rocking away in her rocking chair, tapping her walking stick on the ground, and mumbling about how much she hoped Andrew had enough to eat. Granny Orreen would scrape aside little mounds of food on her plate, and she'll be saying, this for Andrew, this for Andrew, which would in turn infuriate Martin and Kim, who would exclaim back, Granny, you don't care about us. You only care about Andrew, you know. <laughs> Remember, Kim? <laughs> It was so amusing for me to watch this family dynamic and I enjoyed being part of it. I'm, I'm just wrapping it up now. Martin's granny used to say, when I die, I wanna die with a belly full. I am sure she's on the other side waiting for Martin with a plate of chicken and macaroni pie. Only this time, not just for Andrew, but for Martin too. I would like to conclude by saying that we, I hope, we can all graduate from this school of love that we call Earth with our hearts fully ripened. I hope our fruit of love that we offer to God will make him happy. If our fruit is round and ripe, we will be able to fit comfortably into the heavenly realm altogether where other victors of love also live. I pray that this dream of embodying God's love will come true for all of us. And at this time, I would like to welcome up Linda Fields, who would like to offer a poem for Martin. Come, Linda. Well, good morning. I did have a very lengthy, long poem to read and I decided probably not to. <laughs> Thank you. It says, don't die with your dead. Did you know that when you cry for your dead, you cry for you and not them? You cry because you lost them. Because you don't have them by your side. You think it all ends in death. And you think they're, they're not there anymore. So if you're dead, no more, where are they? I just want to say something at this point. Martin lived with me for three years, okay? 
He had nowhere to live. He came to live with me for three years. And a few months ago, he said to me, Lynn, I really want to go. And I used to look at him and say, are you kidding me and leave me here? He said he would slap his hip, his hand and everything else and say to me, Lynn, I'm an invalid. I want to go. Knowing that is the reason why I can stand here before you, holding back the tears to know that he wanted to go where he is today. And believe you me, he's come to visit me many times, prodding me on my hip. And he said, hey, stop scaring the dogs because the dogs would bark a lot in the house when I knew he was there. And I, now I live in a big house all on my own in the middle of a cane field. Do I, am I scared? Hell no. I walk in the house, the first thing I say is, hi, Martin. Because knowing normally when I walk in the house, he's there sitting down with a cup of tea, coffee, smoking a cigarette, in the phone, drive me mad. And I just want you to know, I mean, this poem is lovely, by the way. But I just want you perhaps to know that I'm having the courage to stand here in front of all of you. I'm actually feeling somewhat like David. Okay? And there are reasons for this, which I'm not going to go into. This, is, this whole day is about Martin, my spouse, the man I live with, the man I fed, nurtured, was a psychiatrist to him because he went through a lot of mental instability with the family. I was very, very much involved with getting Martin and Andrew back together in the end, didn't I, Andrew? And you told me so. And the same thing with all of you. And I don't want to come here standing here like if I am the alpha and the omega. Well, I'm definitely not the alpha or the omega right now. I'm just me. But the thing is that I just want, it's giving me a headache. I just want you guys to know that I, I, I want to be able to think that we are all living, standing here together in, in harmony with everybody, not going on about this, that, and the other, and that's for me, and that's for you. It's all rubbish, people. Come together sensibly, honestly, don't tell any lies. There was a way where things were supposed to go and it didn't. And do I care? Hell no. What belongs to you belongs to you. I don't want nothing. I'm telling you now, Gail, I want nothing. Pardon? This hurts, all right? It does hurt me a lot. Because all I wanted from you guys was to acknowledge me. You don't acknowledge me, Andrew. Please. I sat there on my own. Nobody came to say hello. I used to be able to sing. All I want to say is this, that I'm really grateful that I met that man because we did a lot for each other, you know? I was supporting him in all ways, every single way, mentally, spiritually, in every way. And I'm not here to pass judgment on anyone, okay? And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Do you know 
really see Shepherd Tamara Marshall and Derek Fields, Love Song. Sophie Hood will now read the scripture lesson. A reading from John, chapter 14, verses 20 to 24. In that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them he it is who loves me, and he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered him, If a man loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and he will come to him and make our home with him. He who does not love me does not keep my words, and the word which you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Psalm 23, the 23rd Psalm. Dark veil, 
Yet will I fear no ill For you art with me Bend thy rod and stop me Sons of my foes, my head you do with oil anoint, and my cup overflows. Goodness and mercy. Shall surely follow me, and in God's house forevermore, my dwelling place shall be. I speak to you in the name of God, who is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Every good musician knows that silence is the necessary space between the notes. That space which most of us might call our experiences emptiness, absence, or a void is the birthplace of music. That space of silence is as much a part of the music as is each note. Silence is never just emptiness or a void, not in music, not in life, not in death, and not today. And so I ask you, just for a moment, we have been having so much talk all morning, and we have been having so much music all morning, Take a moment and listen to the silence. And having listened to the silence, what did you hear? All of those things. And perhaps you heard the music of Martin's life. You heard his song of love his song of friendship, his song of creativity. Maybe you heard the song of Martin's presence in your life. And I wonder what song he gave to you. How did he touch your life and invite you to join your voice to his in the great song of life? And now maybe your song is that of grief and sorrow, of loss, and your song of love or friendship with Martin. As we keep silence and listen for the song of Martin's life, maybe the music is that of loneliness, sadness, and wondering where he is at this moment, and how we can keep the sound of his music in our ears, in our conscience, and in our future. That, my friends, is the space between the notes. That is the opening to a new sound for you and for all those you love, but no longer see. But pause for a moment and know that his life did not end at his death. Today we stand in that space between the notes, a space that makes room for presence in a new way a space from which God is making all things new. 
I have to tell you that the music of Martin's life now plays in a different key. The music of Martin's life now plays in a different key. And that is what we mean when sometimes we are talking about death and we say that life has changed, not ended. Though we might be able to name the day and maybe even the hour that Martin died, he never knew that moment. He simply moved from this life to a new life. For Martin, the music has not ended. The key has changed. And that means that we must learn to listen in a new way. We must listen with the ears of our hearts. And so in the days ahead, when we think of him, when he comes into our minds and we remember the times we have had together, let us slow down the music and listen with the ears of our heart and listen for the voice of Martin. Listen for the voices of those we love but no longer see and feel their presence surrounding us. St. John's Gospel records Jesus' last meeting with his disciples and how they were concerned about what would happen to them when he was no longer among them. Jesus comforted them with these words, which we often remember on occasions like these. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many rooms. And now we are not troubled because we believe that although Martin has gone from our sight, we can sing the never-ending song of life, an eternal life, as promised by Jesus Christ. That is why we are gathered here today, to give thanks and celebrate the music that was Martin. For Martin, life has changed, but not ended. He has made his transition to another place where all things are put in perspective. And so I leave you with the words of an unknown author that we may think about in our quiet moments. It's an unknown author who said, death takes the body, God takes the soul. Our minds hold the memories. Our heart keeps the love. Our faith let us know. We will meet again. Amen and amen. Derek Fields sings for us again. You raised me up. They 
There is no life, no life without its hunger. Each restless heart beats so imperfectly. But when you come and I am filled with wonder, sometimes I think I see eternity. Shall we bow our heads in prayer? Almighty and ever-loving God, we thank you at this time for the life of our brother Martin. We thank you, Lord, for all that he was and who that he was. We thank you, Lord, for his strengths and for his weaknesses. We thank you for the blessings that you gave him amongst, which he shared amongst us in his lifetime. We shall always have memories of him, Lord, like pretty pictures hanging in our minds. We pray especially at this time for his family, those who are nearest and dearest to him, those who will feel the loss of his absence, but yes, those who have had the blessings of his presence. And gracious God, we commend them into your hands, Help them, Lord, to realize that we as Christian people believe that at death, life is changed, not ended. Grant us, Lord, that to remember the words of your son, Jesus Christ, who said, in my father's house, there are many rooms. We believe that one day we shall meet together in those rooms where there is no illness, no frustrations or fears, no animosity, no disturbance, no old age or illness. Grant us all, gracious Lord, to remember that you are the God of all. As you have made the heavens and the earth, you have made us. You have carved out for us, O oh Lord, our past, our present, and our future. Bless us all gathered here together in this chapel this morning and those who are within sight and hearing virtually. Bless us all, Lord, and help us to remember that with you all things are possible. 
Grant us the peace which you promised in our hearts and love in our lives, now and always. Amen. Together we offer the Lord's Prayer. Shall we pray together? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those that trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Mine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our last him is How Great Thou Art, but before we stand to sing that hymn, let me remind you that as we exit the chapel, we will gather outside of the chapel for the release of the doves, which is a symbolic way of indicating that Martin has left us and gone to be with his maker. Let us stand now as we sing How Great Thou Art. When I know some wonder Consider all the worlds thy hands have made I see the stars I hear the rolling thunder Thy power throughout the universe display. Then sings my soul.
When Christ shall come With shouts of acclamation And take me home What joy shall fill my heart Then I shall bow In humble adoration And there proclaim My God, how great Thou art In seeds my soul, my Savior's love to me How great Thou art How great Thou art In seeds my soul Blessings upon you all. <laughs> goodbye and good night. Go goodbye and good <laughs> and good morning. <laughs>